Good morning, LBC Radio. My name is Corey Rosen, and you're listening to The Story Podcast. Today, I have on a super awesome guest, but before we get into that, I have some merchandise. If you would like to support my work, you can go over to facebook.com forward slash The Story Corey Rosen. Check out our shop there. We have stickers with a five by two inch stickers, and we have shirts and t-shirts. Those are the same thing. Shirts and hoodies <laughs> <laughs> with the first 50 guests on the back. Today, I have on Mr. Braden Cricky. In fifth grade, Braden was hit with the acting bug. Of course, you never know how long of a phase that will last. Luckily for him, and maybe unluckily for his parents, that phase turned into a passion that never went away. After graduating with a BFA in music theater from Lancaster Bible College in 2021, he has been fortunate enough to act in projects all across the nation. Favorite theater credits include Spelling Bee as Chip Understudy and Leaf Understudy, The Little Mermaid as Prince Eric, and The Addams Family as Lucas, and Favorite Favorite film credits include Followed, uh, he played Carter in that one, and The Veal, where he played Young Douglas, and Brave the Dark, Soli de Gloria. You can find his projects and all of his stuff at his Instagram at B-K-R-I-K-K-E. That one, that's a three, not an E. <laughs> and at his website, BrandonCrickKey.com. How yes. are you doing today? Oh, great. How about you? How about you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem, man. <laughs> So you caught the acting bug in fifth grade. What what was it that hit? What was it that bit you? <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Well, I, I got to tell you, you know, when I was in fifth grade, I was um, kind of introverted and, and a little bit, you know, sketched out by performing. Mm. But um, I had the opportunity to perform um, in fifth grade in Beauty and the Beast. Um, we actually I went to a, an arts elementary school after third grade, and um, and so in fifth grade, so we put on these full length two hour musicals really not yeah. even just the junior versions. yeah and so um so i had the opportunity to play the beast and beauty and the beast and that's that's where i fell in love with theater just the whole all the elements of it and and the people involved you know it just really and 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 a lot i owe that a lot to my teacher mrs laura um she she was the one who taught us you know and it was in charge of all the theater and musical elements there and so she really sp- sparked that um that passion for us and 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 mine just never went away and unlike I say unluckily for my parents because they're the ones who had to give me rides everywhere and deal right, with right. The, you know everything so <laughs> right a kid can't drive himself to a theater show exactly yes <laughs> so you got beast right away <laughs> well I had I had done a few things here and there before that I I was singing in choir mm-hmm. I was I I we did the Little Mermaid actually the year before. Um, and um is that where you get your prince eric <laughs> <laughs> yeah i didn't play prince eric then though but i played uh i was in i was like a sailor and i think mm-hmm. i played a priest or something um but um but i don't know for whatever reason it was just fifth grade that that sparked that that interest um and and i don't know i guess it was just that experience in particular that i realized that this is what it could be you know the 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 people and I mean I know I was just in fifth grade and, course, and stuff right. but you know the people that you meet and and the connections that you make you know this, I was like this is something that I want to be a part of for the rest of my life and and um and the the craft in particular obviously you know um it's just something that's just so um it's so I don't know I just love the creation of theater because it's just it's going to be different every time you go to a theater it's going to be a different mm-hmm. show no matter what you know and and what one person brings to a character is going to be completely different than what another person brings to a character which i think is so cool about about the art of theater and just acting in general you know is that the individuality that someone can bring to a character is so unique and i i think that's so cool so yeah so where did you go from there, from from Beast? Where did you go <laughs> from Beast? Well, I did a lot of community theater. I, I grew up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Um, South Dakota. South Dakota. I know not many people grow up there, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it, it was a great. It was a great. I, I grew up in Sioux Falls, which was the biggest city right, of course. in South Dakota. Um, and so we did actually have a lot of art, a lot of theater, a lot of, um, a lot of you know, too. stuff going, oh. a lot of snow <laughs> in the winter. Yeah. And the weather was super random. You know, there actually, there were a few, this is a side note, but there are a few days where it was like one day it was warm, sunny out the next day it was snowing and it felt like winter. Like That's it crazy. went all over the place in That's South crazy. Dakota. <laughs> but, um, what was I talking about before that? Uh, <laughs> Community theaters. Community theaters, yeah. So there's a there's a lot of theater in the area, and, and I did a lot of community theater. Um, there's a theater there called the Orpheum, and then they also had this um, this arts, um, I guess, venue 
um, where they did, uh, um, they had this Dakota Academy of Performing Arts was this performing arts, you know, um, I guess studio within a building called the Washington Pavilion. Um, and and so we put on a lot of shows there too. I did a lot of junior version shows. And then, um, and then there was also like these touring shows that I did um, where we toured around to different high schools and we put on these like little shows about, you know, life lessons and stuff mm. like that. But yeah, <laughs> and, um, but yeah, I did some shows and, and um, probably my favorite show in middle school. Oh, you know what? Yeah, I think it was in middle school that I did was How I Became a Pirate, which is really funny because I'm doing, they're doing How I Became a Pirate right now at that chapel and I, I watched it the other day and it brought it back. A lot of memories for me, but that was Wait, really the, the Little Mermaid is over now. No, no, no. They're they're doing a, another kids show in the morning. Oh, yeah. gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So, um, they do Little Mermaid is their main stage right. show, and then How I Became a Pirate is their kids show. Even though they're kind of both kids shows, but <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> but Little Mermaid's like the main the main one. So, um, but yeah, and then and then when I got into high school, I got very involved in well, I was in marching band. Really? Uh, yeah, I played trumpet and marching. That's band. right, you did play trumpet. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was in band for three years, and I did I did jazz band, I did marching band, I did symphony band or whatever it was. Um, the name concert band. concert band, yeah, 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 and um, and just all that stuff. And I, at first, when I started high school, I was like, oh man, I really love I really love band, and I I also did show choir mm. freshman through senior year, and my freshman year I was so intimidated that I was like, I don't know. I should be a. I was like, it was like a kind of a point for me where I was like, oh, I don't know if I should be a performer because I, I, you know, I was starting to realize more and more how introverted I was and, and um, and how shy I am when you first meet me, um, and and I was just like, show choir is so like, you know, out, out there, there. Right. yeah, and it's a lot of like putting on a show and a lot of you know dancing and singing and and so I was like, oh man, this is intimidating. I loved it, I loved it, but it was intimidating. But by the end of that year, I was like. Um, that yeah, I know this is what I want to do. I still love band, and I still kept going with that a little bit. But I was like, show choir really helped me grow in a lot of ways, and um, especially dancing wise, because at before that I didn't do much dancing. So um, but I did show choir, and then I did shows in um, also the shows that we did in high school, which we did a musical every other year, and then we did like five plays a year. Wow, <laughs> that's a lot. Yeah, I didn't do every play, but of course. Um, I did more plays towards the end of my high school career. But I did do the musicals, which my freshman year we did Adam's Family, and I was, um, I was the little kid on board, believe it or not, because I was still a child looking kid. Right. I actually didn't really. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not allowed to say this on air, uh, but I didn't hit like puberty until like my senior year. But, um. But yeah, and so um, it was kind of like a delayed. I don't know why I wouldn't be allowed to say that. What the heck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh no, can I say puberty? What the heck? Um, but yeah, I. Um, <laughs> but I, I didn't hit puberty till like I, I was like a late bloomer, and so, um, and so, I was still like child looking like my junior year. But yeah, I. Um, um, and then my junior year, we did, um, um, what was it, Guys and Dolls, and I played nicely, nicely in that, and then. I also did some community theater, so yeah, I was involved. <laughs> right. I, I, after spewing my whole life no, story to you, <laughs> I did do a few shows here and there um, throughout Sea Falls, South Dakota. So, so what what made you choose Lancaster, Pennsylvania for for college? Yeah, um, well, it, I I was very um, I was very interested in coming to the East Coast and and making start making connections. And, and I knew that there's like a, a thriving um, theater scene. And um, I was actually at um, a Penn State musical theater intensive between my junior and senior year of high school. And, um, and during that time, uh, um, my dad went to a conference and he, and he saw a sight and sound stand and, um, and he went up to the sight and sound stand and, and he was like, um, my son's interested in, in acting, you know, and, and he's interested in sight and sound. And, He's like, um, is is that something that, or like what, Can like, be done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, like, what, you know, do you have any like recommendations of like schools or things like that? And and, um, the guy behind the the table recommended uh, Lancaster Bible College, and um, and so I ended up checking it out while I was on that intensive at Penn State. Um, after and it was funny because I broke my knee during that intensive. That's oh, no. a side note. But yeah, so we were traveling all over and we broke a knee. But yeah, it was the first time I visited LBC. Um, was during that, and and I loved the campus, and and um, 
and I so I ended up auditioning and and coming to audition day and um and it ended up working out that I went here and um and I auditioned for other schools and stuff but that just seemed to be the best fit so yeah yeah so what was it like to go from South Dakota where it's all over the place to here uh, where it's kind of also all over the place <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of similarities and a lot of differences between between South Dakota and here, you know. Um, the weather is not necessarily the same. <laughs> no, not quite. Because um, South Dakota is just a little more extreme, but for the most part, um, the seasons here are, are like, pretty, um, I guess, what I would have thought would be normal, of, like, to expect in Pennsylvania. Um, but, yeah, and, and in terms of the, the – I don't know if you're asking. Theater. theater yeah, okay, the theater. Scene, yeah. um, the theater scene, um, you know, it, it's interesting because there seems to be a lot more professional theaters in this area. Mm. And I think maybe that's because we're close to all these hot spots, you know. Right. Like New York is, like, two hours away, and Washington, D.C. is, like, close. And, hours, and yeah. um, Harrisburg. York. Yeah, all these big yeah, cities, Philly. you know. And so I have a feeling that that's kind of, like – what helps us well, for sure that's definitely the reason yeah you know have We're all the these path professional always. yeah because a lot of people from new york you know audition for theaters in this area and and so um it's it's just a great it's a great theater scene and and that's one thing that i loved about coming out here was that and especially about going to lbc too was that you know they allowed us and encouraged us to audition and be a part of shows in this area which kind of actually helped me have a leg leg up once I graduated, mm. because um, because I was nice. able to have well connections, but also I had my resume built up a little bit too, and so a lot of people graduating from colleges don't necessarily have professional credits from other colleges because they weren't allowed to. Well, they th- during the summertime is when when they right, when you um, do it. have a a summer gig, but for the most part, um, you know. I, I was lucky enough to be able to have a few credits on my resume when I graduated. So, yeah, that's the thing about LBC that I really enjoy. At least on the theater side, you had uh, at the time David Felty, who uh-huh. was very well connected. Yes, within, he is. Yeah, and yeah, Robert, Robert Bigley, who's still extremely connected <laughs> uh, as well. Yeah, and then you have all of these other like uh, was Heather Graberg on. Yeah, she was there at that time. Yes, she was mm-hmm. an amazing dancer. Oh man, uh, yeah. And you had all of these people who could connect you, and like if you if you literally just asked, hey, where, who's auditioning right now? They could probably send you a list. Yeah, literally, yeah, yeah. And the nice thing about about having people like that on your side too is that they know where you can go to look for gigs too. You know, right. And so I learned a lot about that from them too. So what was it like? Because you had mentioned that you you were just uh, reaching puberty at, <laughs> at high school. Yeah, yeah. Was that still a problem in college at all? I'm not going to lie, dude. Um, when I was auditioning for colleges, I that was right when it hit. Right. And so I was I was a significantly different performer at that time as I was before that and I as I am now because um because I was just learning how to navigate my voice, that's a new voice that I just that I just it was just settling, yeah. you know. Yeah. And so um and so when I was auditioning, I was like, and and I didn't have too much um, vocal training before that point. You know, I had acted a lot and I have sang a lot, mm-hmm. but uh, more like chorally and more in groups and, and more theater. It wasn't necessarily individual voice lessons that I've had. I mean, I did have a few, but um, but not with my new voice, too. And so um, and so that was a struggle um, starting out. And, and, and before I hit puberty, um, my voice was insanely high. And um, and and I was like an alto basically in choir. And then when I hit puberty, I, I went down to like a baritone level, and I had like maybe two, three notes. <laughs> okay, now I'm I'm kind of exaggerating, but I I had like significantly smaller range, and so that was a really big like hit for me because I I the few voice lessons that I went on, um, my voice teacher was like, oh, you're probably gonna be like a tenor for the rest of your life, and I was right. like, oh great. Oh, great. And then I was like, I and I was really excited about that, and that was like my mindset. And then when I hit puberty, it all. I remember. Um, I think I guess I did go to voice lessons a few times because I remember one of the voice lessons. He was like, "Okay, you're you're a baritone now," and I was like, "Oh no, oh no!" Because <laughs> yeah. because and right. I mean, you know, looking back, I'm actually, I'm glad it turned out that way because as a baritone, you're able to like kind of do extrace, way more things. And well, you're able to, to increase your range. You know, and I, that's something that I didn't 
really know oh. at the time was that, you know, because I didn't know much about the voice, but I was like, oh my gosh, once you're stuck with three notes, you have three <laughs> notes the rest of your life. But it's not true, you know, the more you work on your voice, the more you're able to do with it, which it makes sense because, you know, it's, it's there are mus- muscular elements to it. And, right. And, um, and it's something that you can work on and, and grow in. But, you know, at the time I was just like, oh no, I'm... I'm. I don't know if I'm gonna be able I'm to even broken. do this professionally. Yeah, yeah. I was like, am I gonna even be good enough? Um, but you know, since then I've been able to work on it, and that's also why I, and I know not a lot of performers. I mean, a lot of performers go to college, but some don't. You know. Mm-hmm. But I know for someone like me, like that's what I appreciated most about college was that I was able to work on things specifically throughout, like my voice, singing, acting, and work on that. And just focus on that for four years um, and then leave and potentially, you know, have better tools and, and, and an understanding of the craft and how what I can bring to the craft. So, yeah. In my mind, there's only one question. Uh, <laughs> how did you sing If I Can't Love Her as an alto? <laughs> <laughs> Up the octave, dude. Oh, yeah, right. Yep. Yeah. No, I, I it was funny because I remember... I remember if I can't love her, and we didn't have a band either. It was just Miss Laura playing the piano. Oh, okay. It was just Miss Laura playing the piano, and um, and I remember she was like, "We're gonna add this song into the show" because I don't think it was in it for some reason. What? I don't know if it was the full version or if it was like if it was like the version that she put together or something. I honestly have no idea. But I remember she said we're adding it to the show somehow, and then I was like, okay. And we slowed it down, but it's funny because at the end of if um, of that song, um, it's like kind of like a power note, and usually he's oh, like it belting is. it out. Well, for me, it was like it was so high that I couldn't do that, and so I just flipped up into falsetto. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, "Let the world be done with me." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, a, a really, a really trite way of instead of the power powerhouse. <laughs> yeah, it was more introverted. Right, of course, I'm yeah. kidding. I'm kidding. But um, but yeah, so that's uh, that's something that was, I guess, something that happened to me. <laughs> well, well, I mean, it's it's so curious because the, your uh, the voice changes a lot between uh, pre pu during that time. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it changes yeah. immensely, and yeah. you have to deal with that. Yeah. Uh, Especially as a singer, I'm sure it just kind of flipped your entire world upside down. Because <laughs> um, they're like, yeah. oh, I went to college for voice and I had this alto voice. But now all of a sudden I have this voice that I don't even Completely know. Completely different. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's when I that's when I started listening to a lot of Micah Buble. Because it was some of the only songs that I could sing was Micah Buble. Um, because he's a baritone. And even then I still couldn't really sing a lot of it. But I... Um, but I and but the thing about it was that I still tried to, and I think that's the thing that a lot of what I would like to say to a lot of like young people and young singers who you know might hit something like that in their or will hit something yeah, well, like that yeah, in your yeah. life, you know, keep singing because no matter where you are now, you can always work on it and you can always get better and you can always improve and, and grow um, if you're passionate enough about it and if you if you put the work in, you know, that's you can get to places that you might potentially never think that you might have been able to go so. right and keep trying stuff yeah and keep trying keep stuff keep and trying stuff be open to new things i mean especially as an artist you know things are always changing things right. are always changing in the industry in any arts industry you know it's kind of an ebb and a flow and just whatever trends are happening now are happening now but i think the most important thing you need to do is think about who you are as an individual and what you can bring to the craft and also like you were saying earlier Explore new things, and that'll help expand your horizons and think about things in potentially new ways. So. Yeah, so it'll unlock things that you love that you didn't know you love. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. I, I know a lot of uh, th- theater people who switched to techies. Yeah. Because they started doing stage stuff, and they were like, oh, I love this is fun. Yeah, working on costumes or set design or yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and these, that's important <laughs> yeah it, it is it's very important you can't put on a show with any of those people you know right um and every aspect of every job is important in theater because without you know one even one person the whole balance could be off that's so, right yeah so what was your first show in L- at lbc my first show at lbc was um mary poppins oh. yeah I, I must say the mary poppins that we put on was incredible <laughs> 
I was I was very I was very lucky coming into it as a freshman to be able to be a part of, uh, of such a, a great experience that that was. You know, that was like I said earlier was was when I got to meet a lot of the people and and um and grew close with them, which was which was great. Um, but also just like what um you know Dave David felt he was able to bring to the show and Brian Mathis, the assistant director, um was able to bring to the show. It was just it was a wonderful experience and everyone was so you know, uplifting, and it was just a different culture that I guess I necessarily wasn't wasn't necessarily used to um, in Sioux Falls. It was just different, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. every group of people, like I was saying, is different, but yeah. Um, and so, but that was yeah. That show was in particular was was a lot of fun, and um, and you know, really reignited a different passion I think for me too. Um, and what a show to start off on, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you haven't seen Mary Poppins' the show, you should go see that because it is a spectacle and a half. It is a spectacle. It, there's a lot of a lot of moving parts and quite literally. Yeah. Were, were you one of the chimney sweepers? Uh, I was Bert. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what was it like to fly? It, dude, it was that was the first time I ever flew on stage. Um, it was a lot of fun, and and um, but it was also it was hard because. I think for the whole show I had to wear the harness, oh, which is no. which is very tight. It's very tight around your waist, um, and the reason it's so tight is because the harness that I had allowed me to go upside down. Right. But it doesn't go over the shoulders, so it has to be tight enough around the waist and, oh, and that area to to um to hold you up and to go upside down. And so um, but yeah, but but when you're flying, it's it's a lot of fun, um, but. I remember one time though, because I have to sing when I'm flying too. At one point, <laughs> <laughs> right? And actually, we're dealing with that now with Little Mermaid too. I don't fly, but Ariel flies mm-hmm. and she has to sing. Um, but yeah, it's just a whole different experience singing while you're being lifted in the air. And I remember one time, um, there's I'm supposed to sing like over the rooftop, step in time or whatever, mm-hmm. and um, and and I was supposed to be in the center, but there was like we got like and then. Um, someone grabbed my legs or whatever and like held me up and made it look like they were holding me up. But there was one day where it happened where I was just so slightly off that like <laughs> he was trying to grab my legs and I was just a little bit off and I was supposed to go over the rooftop and it was clear that we didn't hit the mark. And I I went over the rooftop, step in time. And I like <laughs> laughed a little bit, but it sounded like a voice crack and I was like, well, great. This is great. <laughs> but yeah, that was um fun little flying story that that happened but yeah for the most part it was it was a lot of fun and and that show really helped me connect with people and and um ignited a different passion so. how much training did you have to do for that flying sequence because don't you have to use a lot of muscles yeah well it, it's we did have to do some training because um it was it, it was a different company that brought it in i think it was zfx i could be wrong but that that they came in and and um, set up the flying, you know, rig or whatever you call it, and um, and so they trained us and basically they just went through different things of like okay because the balance of the harness has to be like right in the middle of your of you. of your balance yeah <clears throat> and so um and so they told us like what to do with that and and um how to f- spin and how to like have control because like. If you're not spinning, but if you're like laying, you know, parallel to the ground, that's another set of muscles as, as it is yep. when you're like flipping upside down. Um, and so they trained us on that stuff too. And um, and yeah, and I remember because Richard was my understudy, he also trained. And I remember I was like watching him. And I was like, what an acrobat! He already yeah, he, he, already he went does. on Richard Thomas. He he is yeah he's awesome. But yeah, he he went right on um on the. On the, I think he he was just doing flips like right away. <laughs> I was like, of course, of course. <laughs> he he would do that. He would. Yeah. Um. So, uh, from there, where where do you go for acting? From acting. Um. From Mary Poppins. From Mary Poppins. Yeah. I um. Oh man, I can't remember. I think we did um. I think the next show was Opera Workshop, which was the Magic Flute. Um, yeah. Yeah, and it was the modern take that it was great. Yeah, um, it was a lot of fun that show too. I wasn't as involved in that one, um, but I was like the prince the that prince, was right. ch- chased by the beginning at the g- beginning by the centipede, by the big <laughs> caterpillar looking thing. Um, and then I was also a guard in that one, um, and that one was a lot of fun. It was a different experience because it was opera workshop, and and 
and so is more operatic in its style, obviously. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, but um, but yeah, that was fun. And then and then after that, I don't think I did. So that summer, I went back to Sioux Falls and worked because I was actually an MC for weddings at the time. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. And so um and so I am. I had weddings lined up that summer that I had to go back for um, and, and MC there. So I MC'd there, and then I also worked at this place called the Phillips Avenue Diner, um, which was just this classic-looking diner. And the, and it was I had a lot of fun working there because my best friend at the time worked there and um, and also just a lot of cool people. But, um, but yeah, so I went back that summer. Uh, I didn't do any theater, you know, I was just like, I need to make some money, I need to kind of recoup for next year, and just kind of prep for the next year, and then, um, and then, um, sophomore year, what was sophomore year? Was that, by, no, was that Bye Bye Birdie? It must have no, been. No, was it Bye Bye Birdie? It was, it had to be. Yeah. Yeah. When was Ruth? Well, Ruth was junior year, I believe. I think Ruth was junior yeah. year. Yeah. So I think Bye Bye Birdie. Yeah, because I was, broke my I don't know why this is all getting mixed up in my head. But yeah, Bye Bye Birdie happened when I was in college. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best way to put that. That's... Um, no, it was it was um, that was a lot of fun too, and that actually, yeah, that was that was um, it was a completely different style of show than Mary Poppins. It was it was very upbeat, very um, very, you know, just yeah, completely different in style, um, and that one was just more like fun and and just got to put a lot of energy into it and. And stuff. You and, were El, um, El, the Elvis character, right? Yeah, like the Elvis type. I was, yeah. I was Conrad Birdie. Um, but that was a lot of fun. Honestly, Sincere was a lot of fun to sing. Um, and yeah, and then since then, um, I did. I think that was the year I started doing more theater stuff in the area. I started working for Revival a little bit when they were just first beginning mm. with Heather. Um, we did a little mis- miscast uh, cabaret type thing. Um and then I, oh yeah, we did Servant Stage, I think, that year. And that's the year that I met my best friend, Mitch Aiello, who's now an artistic director for Great Plains Theater. Um, but he was in Titanic with me, and he um, he and I got very close during that time. And um, and then I also did another Servant Stage show that year, which was Christmas Carol. I played Fred slash Old Joe, and that was the same role that Mitch played, too, because it was double cast. And, mm. and so we got to bond um, during that time, and that's when, when we became very close friends. And then he went on and... Did um the national tour of um, um oh my gosh my can Paw Patrol Paw Patrol live Paw Patrol Paw Patrol live yeah like the um, kid show yeah there's a live version of it a national tour yeah really yeah and he was one of the leads for that so um so he went on and did that right after that which is which is crazy to be like oh my gosh I literally just met this guy and he's doing a tour and at the time for me I was like that's insane and it still to me is insane you know I just I think it's so cool like when someone goes on and does something like that that you and like, then you know them yeah and you know them yeah so um but um but yeah so i met mitch during that time and then we did uh christmas carol and then so i think junior year was ruth yeah, <laughs> yeah which was a lot of fun too i got to play a villain i think for the first time in my life um yeah so i played the king yeah um and um and that was a lot of fun i got to add certain elements of myself that I don't necessarily get to access too much, you know? So that was mm-hmm. fun. Um, and then senior year. Oh, and so, and, and then I think, yeah, the summer after my sophomore year, I think I skipped that. Um, that was the first show I did at the Fulton Theater, which was uh, Mamma Mia. How's that? Oh, man. That was so much fun. That was so much so fun. Much about that. I was I was really nervous going into that, though, because, um, because that was my first equity theater gig at, um, project that I was a part of. Um, and for those who don't know, what is that? Yeah, mean? so equity means it, it's it's the actors' union. Mm. Um, and so if you're doing an equity show, that means that 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 theater is affiliated with the union. And and with the union, there are certain benefits that you get to it. But you know, like Broadway theaters are union theaters, and and there are many union theaters. But usually, it just it, it doesn't necessarily mean more professional. It just means that it's it's kind of established that. That it's it's very high level. It's high level. You know what I mean. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of non-union theaters that put on very high level shows that aren't union. But if you're union, it usually means it's that like a you're, guarantee almost. Yeah. It. I mean, not necessarily like a guarantee, but usually it's just a little bit. 
you know, it's just, um, but anyway, yeah, so it means you're part of the union and also the, so that means that a lot of the actors are part of the union as well because you can join the union as an actor and you can, um, y- you get like better, you know, pay normally if you're part of the union mm-hmm. and you also get, um, you get certain health benefits, you know, that's where the health oh, wow. benefits come in. Yeah, if you do a certain amount of, of work every year, you get health benefits um, and awesome. and so it basically it means that you're kind of like it's the union's supposed to like protect you in certain ways as an actor although lately it's been diff- it's been there's been drama but um, <laughs> but uh, yeah so that was my first so I was very nervous going into the Fulton theater gig because right. that was my first equity theater experience so I remember every day I was just so nervous that I'm like I'm gonna say something wrong and then they're gonna like cancel me they're gonna, right like, of course, tell yeah. everyone they're gonna be like. Braden is the worst to work with and don't hire him. But no, it wasn't anything like that. And so, yeah, I was just in the ensemble and it was just so much fun and I was able to relax into it a little bit after after some time. And and um, and so, yeah, the people involved with that were, were very fun and and yeah, it, it ended up being a, just a very wonderful experience. That summer was one of my favorite summers of my life, I think. Um, but, um, and then, uh, so then after... That summer, yeah, that was when we did Ruth. Um, and then, were there any other shows? That I don't know, because COVID happened then. That was COVID. Was Charlie Brown. Uh, ma- oh, that Charlie happened. Brown, that's right. Yeah, yeah, Charlie Brown was one of the shows that we were supposed to do at, right when COVID hit. Um, and then, obviously, it ended up getting canceled. And then, yeah, COVID um, just kind of changed the whole game for, for the theater everybody, department and yeah. everybody. And, and, yeah, so everything went online, and we did um, – zoom classes and i had to record myself doing dances and and for dance class and stuff like that but um but yeah once once COVID was over we were able to put on charlie brown again and it was just like a socially distanced version of it we were each it was really cool um cassidy martin directed that yeah yeah and um and it was really cool because just the 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 creative elements that came from the fact that COVID, Mm -hmm. you know COVID exists and 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 i think that that kind of caused um a reason to be a little bit more creative in certain ways, which I think was really cool about, yeah. the, you know, I mean, obviously COVID was not fun. <laughs> of course. But there, you know, there is, but it you pushed know, things you guys. That, yeah, things in different ways, good yeah. things that came out of it in, in certain ways, you know. And so I think one of those things was was the fact that we got to, you know, be a little bit, you know, do, um, do Charlie Brown in a different way. Because the way um, it worked was you, you guys had like squares on on the yeah, stage. Yeah. So yeah, basically we were each in our own bubble and we had like our own feet, square right? that we got to act in. But, um, but when we weren't acting or when we weren't in a scene or something, we were just like in our own different world, just kind of like playing like children would play, um, playing Schroeder. You know, I got to kind of play the piano. Yeah. I got to sleep, whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was fun. And 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 whenever we had an interaction with someone else on stage, you know, we we would just like face them and, and, and stuff like that and pop up the lights would change and um yeah and so that was kind of that was that was show was was very fun too in its own way and um, a very unique way in a very unique way yeah, yeah yeah but you know that's that's sort of stuff is what I live for be is when something is done differently I think that's just so cool because it's like it's something new that's that's you know I don't know I just love that kind of stuff but um but yeah and then after that um after that so senior year, um, I did. Wait, what did I do between? That's a good question. The summer between junior and senior. Oh yeah, that was COVID. That was COVID. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say that's yeah. I was like, did I do any theater? I was like, no. Probably not. I was at home. So wh- after um, after you graduated, uh, what were some of the things that you wanted to do? Uh, now you're free from school. You can <laughs> kind of go wherever you want. What were some of the things that you immediately wanted to do? Yeah, it was crazy because well, actually during my senior year. I had my first callback for a national tour, which was Sound of Music for Rolf. Um, and and that was when I was doing, um, when I was in uh, Singing in the Rain. Um, mm, that's why we did that too. Yeah, we did that too, yeah. Um, but during that time was when I was being considered for, for Rolf. And so that kind of changed my perspective a little bit about like, I was like, um, when I got that callback, I was like, oh, maybe maybe this is kind of like, you know, the direction that I should pursue things is, you know, national tour type stuff. And and obviously, you know, every career is going to be different in, in terms of what you pursue and stuff. But that kind of changed my perspective because I was like, 
never in a million years would I ever think I'd get a call back for a national tour. You know what I mean? Of course. Um, but when that happened, I was like, oh, this is, this is crazy. Um, and I ended up not getting that gig, but the whole experience was insane. I mean, it was over Zoom. The, the ca- whole casting process was over Zoom. That was when I first met Stuart and Whitley, which is a, this big casting a- um, agency in New York. Um, and so that was when I got to meet people from that team. And, and, um, but it was all over Zoom, and it was during when I was doing, um, doing Singing in the Rain. So there, I remember there was one night where I had to film something, and, and I had like three days to film it. And I was, we were like in tech or something for, for Singing in the Rain. And I was like, oh, man, I don't know how this is going to go. I was like, I don't know how these tapes are going to turn out. You know, what, you know what, what's going to come of this? And I ended up staying up till like one a.m. <laughs> trying to get the tapes done, and um, and so, but yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. But I forgot the original question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's uh, like well, that that was that was it. What did you do after college? Oh where, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. like where where was I wanting to go? Yeah. yeah, and so that that kind of that kind of you know helped change my trajectory and, and perspective a little bit. And so um, since then, you know, I've done. But right after college, I, I ended up going to Kansas. Um, Why? So, like, my, my best friend, Mitch Aiello, is actually the artistic director in Kansas. So that's okay. where Great Plains Theater is. And so my first gig out of college was um, was in Greece. I played Sonny, and I understudied Danny. Um, and that was a lot of fun. And, sure. I mean, Greece and Kansas is, like, the, you know, it fits perfectly. It fits, it's Kansas right, it's, is it's, yeah. the best place to do Greece. And, um, and so it was, um, it was, and the people that I met and, and it was, it was interesting cause it, you know, right. When you're in college for four years, you're kind of used to a certain process and you're used to certain people and you, you kind of get to a certain comfort level. Well, once you get into the real world, there's a lot of different elements that you don't necessarily think about until you get into that moment. And once you meet new people, you know, it's, it's just different, but, um, but it was so much fun and it was a lot of, it was, it was just the people that I met are some of my close, I mean, very close friends now. And, and, um, obviously I'm very close with Mitch too, which was just, was just really awesome to be able to do that show that summer. But, um, yeah, so I did Greece and then I did, um, the music man right after that, which I played Uwert Dunlop. It's actually Uwert Dunlop, but I called him Uwert Dunlop and no one else wanted to call him Uwert. <laughs> but no, but it was it was a lot of fun. He's he's one of the quartet members. So, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So, um, but and then after that, I came back here. Uh, ended up moving to a, um, a new place, and um, and I I started auditioning for things in the area. And so I think the first thing that happened next was Gretna Theater. Um, oh no, you know what? I think it was Adam's Family. I did Adam's Family, and it was a professional level production. Um, it was through Creative Pursuits Academy, yeah. which I also work for them too as a social media manager. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. That's cool. Um, but that was a professional level, and it was it was directed by um, Matthew Heizek. Have you heard of Matthew Heizek at all? I have not. Okay. So it's, he's. It's, did you get one of my messages when I when I sent uh, a reach out to Creative Pursuits? I don't know if I did. Did you reach out to Creative <laughs> Yeah, I reached out to I reached out a lot of theaters through like messengers. Oh, I didn't <laughs> notice that. I'll have to look through the messages. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> no, it's, it's funny. Um, um, but anyway, so um, we were doing uh like a professional level production, and Matthew Hadzik was directing it. And Matthew Hadzik um is someone who's done a bunch of Broadway shows. He was mm-hmm. uh, Tony and West Side Story. He was um. Um, just in the share show, um, he's was in Greece on Broadway too. He played Kaneki, um, and stuff like that. So it was really, really cool to do that, ex- have that experience with him as a director, and and meet him and and talk with him. And and I played Lucas and Adam's family, which so I got I was lucky enough to have um some one on one interaction with him too. And um, but that was a lot of fun. So that that production was kind of a combination of like professionals in this area. And also students of Creative Pursuits Academy, mm-hmm. so it was a really cool experience. Um, and we ended up putting it up at the Junction Center, um, and and that was yeah, that was a lot of fun. So Adam's family, um, and then after that, I ended up going to Gretna Theater for two projects. The first one was um, 
uh, Strictly Platonic. <laughs> That's what it's Strictly called. Strictly Platonic. Uh, it was this new work. We were doing a reading for it, um, a staged reading. Um, and there's musical elements. It was, it was musical. Um, but yeah, that was an interesting experience. Um, and then after that, I did this project called Nevermore, which was these plays that, um, or the, sorry, it was like we, we performed certain works by Edgar Allan Poe. It was around. Yeah, okay, that's what I yeah, thought it was. Yeah, it was around um, Halloween time. Of course. And it was in the Gretna area, which if you don't know Gretna, um, there's a lot of porches in the area. It's kind of open, you know, people are just out and about. And um, so what we did for the project was we had each person because it was just each person just did a monologue. Mm. And so we had people scattered throughout the area. It wasn't necessarily on a theater stage, but we had people scattered throughout the area when it's kind of dark and and um, and people were on porches. People were in different areas. And so um, I was one on a porch, too. And so I got to I got to do um, the Raven, the Raven. Yeah, oh, I got to do the Raven. Um, but yeah, that was interesting. And, and it was interesting because. You know, I've never performed a monologue like that before in a professional setting. Usually I use monologues for auditions and stuff, and it's not necessarily Edgar Allan Poe, you of know? Of course, like, right. Normally, it's just more, and, and I tend to lean more con, uh, contemporary, but um, but Edgar Allan Poe was um, was very fun, and it was just a new challenge. Because you and, probably got to interpret and act out as well yeah yeah a monologue yeah and i kind of got to create it my own way yeah. um and um so that was a lot of fun and then after that was when i was when i started doing um a little bit more uh, stuff at the fulton um so i started out doing spelling bee there um i understudied chip and i understudied leaf um and i got to go on actually for chip for three performances um and so that was so much fun, and that was my first time that I got to go on like in a named role at an equity theater, which was just in it was just crazy for me, you know, and and I was like just intimidated every day, but <laughs> everyone was so so good in that show. So that was that was a lot of fun. And then after that, I did two kids shows. Um, I did um, Sherlock Holmes. Like, did you were you in them or were I was you... in them? Yeah. Okay. Um, in Sherlock Holmes, I was the royal guard. <laughs> um and then um and then I also did um The Little Mermaid but it was the Mark Robin version of Little Mermaid so it wasn't necessarily the Disney version but I got to play the prince in that um which was also a lot of fun um and and the people involved in that were very fun, was were very very awesome too and yeah and so that was great and then after that um was when I did w- what I'm doing now which is The Little Mermaid at Dutch Apple I'm playing prince again um and that's been a wonderful experience so far. So that brings us to today. Sorry there for rambling. There's, there's the entire life story that is of the Waiting Creaky. Entire life story. Thank you for listening. <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm sorry about how long no, it was. <laughs> um, so you also got into film as well. How did that happen? Yeah. Um, well, I I was just interested more and more throughout my college experience with doing film, um, because I just love the acting elements of it. I love how internal it is. And, and I kind of got interested with um, film acting a little bit more once I started taking Meisner class here, which is, if you don't know what Meisner is, it's, it's an acting technique um, that, that kind of encourages you to, you know, think more about the other person and what they're doing and then reacting truthfully. And it's just kind of an, ex- an extension of Stanislavski, which is kind of the, and Stanislavski is the base, <laughs> sorry, is the basic, the most common acting technique okay. um, but Meisner is an extension of that so we did a lot of repetition exercises which means just basically repeating back and forth what you see in the other person whatever it is behaviorally and then letting that mm-hmm. affect you and then it just kind of is a chain effect and you affect each other continually and so it helps build that tool of being affected when you're on stage in a show in an emotional way and um, and I think that Meisner that type of acting technique is translates super well to film. And so that's when I first started getting very interested in that because I love Meister technique and I love film acting. And so that's when I started looking into that a little bit and started submitting to different projects and things like that. And um, I ended up doing a, a student film called Followed. Um, and that was, that was a lot of fun. And I got to play Carter in that. Um, and I, I was... Um, 
so that was interesting and, and it was a lot of fun and, and that was when I got to learn a lot about like the film acting and, and how subtle sometimes things need to be mm-hmm. for a film because you know even the slightest m- movement like with your That's eyebrow something. whatever yep. it could mean something completely different than than you know when you do something differently but um but yeah and then and then since then I did um the veil which was produced by film frontier and um, um that was my first well, that was actually not my. That was my first SAG film. My first, which is the union for for okay, film. Okay, gotcha. So the the first union film that I did since graduation was Brave the Dark, which actually was filmed close in this area, and I, I know a few other people that were involved in that. But most, but I was like an extra in that, and then I got to be actually featured a little bit. They just kind of randomly chose me I was to kind say, of. That be, was like the recent one, like the that was a big feature movie, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a feature was, movie. That yeah, was, uh, that was filmed here. here. Um, and so yeah, there's some I can't remember the actor's name, but um, he was in it. I remember um, the main actor was in it. He was like the bully in it. I can't remember the bully Nathan um, Nathan I, something. I think. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I got to be in a few scenes with him in the background. But right, well, <laughs> I was like, course. whoa, look at him do that thing. Way over there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but but then after that, I was a part of another SAG film, which which was it was my first SAG union film where I, I was a supporting role. So um, it was an interesting experience because it was an independent film still, and there were certain elements that like made it, you know, a little stressful because you know we're push crunch for time they try to film right. this this thing in 10 days and they came actually is it a feature it's a feature like film a full length? it's it's like a full length yeah wow 10 um, days 10 days so and there's only three actors in the film um okay, that makes, makes it two of them come from la and and actually the whole team was from la but they came to pa because it's based in pa and they wanted someone mm-hmm. local to play the younger version of the lead and so that's the character that i played which was young douglas um and he's at the beginning and the end of the film and if you watch the film it's kind of it's like a psychological thriller type thing oh. um it's not out yet but um i don't know how much i can say <laughs> i don't i think it's fun to talk about it but yeah it's um psychological thriller um and actually none of these films are officially out yet <laughs> oh, wow really yeah but follow it is coming out soon it was actually just in a it was just in a a film festival film festival but um but yeah the veil um was was a lot of fun but yeah we were pressed for time actually and so my scenes weren't didn't get we didn't get to them till the end of the last day and um i was only there for like one day out of the 10 but um it was kind of it was kind of just it's it's it was just interesting to see how all the elements worked on an independent SAG film versus like, you know, the brave uh, the brave the dark one, which was a little bit bigger mm-hmm. and and had a little bit more of a budget, you know, um, but the, but it was honestly the, I think the independent film kind of added elements of creativity because there weren't as many things or rules that you had to follow, yeah, and yeah, you know, um, but yeah, I, I I honestly don't know how the you know what to expect with that film and how it's going to turn out, but I think it's going to be it's going to be um, a, a, a good project, a good, a good film to watch. So watch out for it, you guys. Watch out for it. <laughs> so what, what's the difference between auditioning for a, a music, uh, musical theater gig and, and uh, a film, essentially? Yeah. Um, musical theater, well, and actually the audition process for musical theater has kind of changed a lot significantly sure. since COVID, COVID. hit. Um, and so a lot of it's actually the same – than it would be for film because oh. because what it used to be with musical theater was even for the initial audition, um, you would go in person and you would sing a cut from your book. And what your book is, is just a bunch of different songs that you have prepared with small cuts from each that you go in with different styles and whatever the show, whatever fits the show best, you sing that song, you perform that song for them. And you might do monologue but that was in person and, and it's you walk in and there's people at a table and you sing for them, right? Um, and for film, um, you know, primarily it's submitting tapes. It's submitting mm-hmm. recordings of scenes of yourself and it might be stuff from whatever project, project you're submitting for directly or it might be like a monologue or like an acting reel that you submit initially. And then if you get a callback, then you submit stuff from 
that project in particular. But theater's kind of developed that way now too. Okay. So a lot of the film industry or a lot of the theater industry is now taking initial submissions via video. So how do you prepare for that? Um, so preparing for that, it's basically just a lot of recording yourself. Um, and and a lot I have a lot of videos of myself singing cuts from my book, right? And so if if um, an audition calls for a specific style, um, I can just use the same video to submit for that, which is actually makes it a lot easier. And I sure. appreciate that because it doesn't necessarily take as much time as you, it would if you were going in person to audition. Although when you go in, there are a lot of benefits to being seen in person too, because you get to kind of get to know someone a little bit better. And I'm sure it might but, be a plus for those, uh, those judges, I don't, I forget what you call them. <laughs> <laughs> Casting directors. Yeah. Casting directors. Uh, um, because then you're like social pressure, right? Performing for people. Yeah, yeah. Instead it's of just different. videotaping the, the, the best take. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's it, there is a pressure with that too. With, with self-tapes is that there is time for you to make the best take that you possibly can of yourself. But if you're a perfectionist, which most performers are, it's gonna take you're going to be like, wow, that little thing is a little off, whatever. But but I think over time, the more I've done it, the more I've realized, you know, just to let those little things go. And mm-hmm. especially for an initial submission, you know, they're just trying to see if you'd be right for the show. Of course. And, they, and if they want to see more from you, they'll see more from you. But you just kind of have to trust the process. And so, yeah, but now a lot of things are, are videos. And then a lot of times from a video, you might get an invite to come in person to audition or submit more material from the show. Um, so a lot of callbacks that I've had, um, I've commuted into New York and I've been seen in person for theater. Um, but a lot of the film stuff that I've, uh, that I, that I, I booked um, was just strictly from tapes. So I'm curious, what's the process? Cause you've done a little bit of Broadway work or auditioning for Broadway. Auditioning. Yeah. How, how does that differ from the Lancaster, uh, PA versus you know top of the world New York City Broadway. <laughs> um, I mean, I think the most comparable. Well, I don't know. It it it's the basics kind of stay the same throughout okay. theater. Um, a lot of the audition process is pretty similar. I mean, every audition is going to be slightly different in right. a certain way, you know. But for the most part, you know, you go into a room, and and people are sitting there, and they're just there, and and. They're on your side, but it's really it's really easy for you to be like intimidated, you know, right, right. right. Um, but yeah, but um, so for the most part in New York, it's just more intimidating, okay, because the stakes gotcha. are just a little bit higher, and you go into these rooms where people have a lot of power and have a lot of connections, right? Mm-hmm. And so you know, it's already oversaturated as well. <laughs> trying to break <laughs> in a lot of people, yeah, and so um, and so these people have the power. To, I mean, not that they're gonna like talk bad about you if of you course. do a bad audition, but they have the power to just make or break you. Yeah, basically. Bit. So, um, so it's just a little more pressure going into it because you want to do a good job and make a good first impression. And and um, and I remember one audition that I had in New York. Um, it was actually my first in person audition for Stuart and Whitley. Luckily, they already knew me right from a few callbacks prior. Um. But my first in-person audition was for a cruise line, and for some reason they were casting it, which I don't know. Normally they cast like Broadway stuff and, and Broadway tours, but they were casting a cruise line. And I, I, I got a call back in person, and so I, I commuted into New York, and there wasn't a monitor. And usually there's a monitor, which a monitor is basically someone waiting outside the room to help you sign in and to tell you when you're next and whatever. Right. Well, for this audition, they just had a list, and you just sign your name, and then um, someone from the Stuart Whitley office came out and looked at the list and was like, "You're next," and then went back into the room to like You're next, ca- to like ha- cast it. It was so weird, right? Um, but yeah, there there were. Um, well, it wasn't weird. It was just it was just different. It was some, it wasn't right. something that I was right. expecting. It was it was different than what I was expecting, and so it kind of just threw me off because um, because I was I had just came into the building and I just signed up and then they said, "Okay, you're next," and I right, right, right. after I signed up. And I still, and I was still getting settled in, whatever. And I was like, oh, okay, okay. So I, I put my backpack down. I grabbed my my music, my book, 
And I walked in, and as I was walking in, I realized I still had my headphones around my neck. And I know it's not that big of a deal, but to me, I was like, great. Great. This first impression is awesome in person. And so I, it just threw me off. And um, and I was like, oh, no. And so I took the headphones off really awkwardly, said I'm on the piano. And then I went over to the um, piano player and um, showed her you know, what I was singing or whatever, went in, and I was thrown off so much by the headphones that when she started, I just started, like, I was not in tune right away. I was like, oh, no. and I was singing Good For You by Olivia Rodrigo. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, well, good for you, really easily. And then I was on after that, but it was just, it was not a great first impression. But since then, I've had more callbacks for them, so that's that's, that's good. a good sign. I was like, that. at least they didn't cancel me, you know? Right, right, right. Like, oh, he's but, awful. <laughs> yeah. I was like, uh, I hope they know that that was a mistake and not the way right. I normally perform. But, um, but yeah. So, yeah, it's it's been it's been crazy. It's been crazy. But. You've also done some model work. Yeah, I've done I've done a little bit of model work. Um, I've done um, I've done some model. Like, I, I guess I, I've been in a few videos for a few local businesses, and um, that's fun. And um, but yeah, I, I haven't done too much modeling actually. I've done I think just like one or two projects. Is that something you want to get into? Or? Yeah, I'm interested in it. I'm interested in it. Um, I've been told by a few professionals throughout since I graduated, and people that I worked with was that they, you know people keep telling me that that you know modeling is is a line of work that I might want to look into. And I was like, okay, well, um, I don't know necessarily too much about it, so it's something I'm still researching. Um, and because I know that's kind of a different world it is mm-hmm. the agents and, and all that are different and, and, you know, how you work, it's kind of just for like one day. But, you know, um, but they get to use your face for like a brand or something like that, which um, the, the pay for it sometimes is, is pretty significant, which is, is nice. But um, I'm not necessarily as passionate about modeling. You know, I, I am more into the acting and singing side of things. But um, but I do think modeling is is fun from what I've, I've you know, I got to do with it and. Um, so yeah, it's something that I'm still kind of looking into as I go forward. So, so what are some future projects plans for you? Um, future project plans. Well, I do have something coming up here, but I'm actually not allowed to talk about it. <laughs> oh, that's, uh, I, I can talk about how excited I, excited excited I am are. to do it. <laughs> but anything beyond that or is, it, um, is that your main focus? Yeah. So, um, yeah, f- I, I have a, a pretty significant project coming up here starting August uh, 12th, but um, I'm technically not supposed to... Of course, right. Um, say, anything, say anything um, until it. everything's been announced officially. Right. Um, but that'll take a lot of my time, basically. Gotcha. Um, but then after that project, I'm planning on moving to New York and um, and um, going from there and, and potentially doing a little... Finding an agent and, and, and submitting a little bit more there. So... Um, yeah, Fun that's kind stuff. of what the yeah, yeah, kind of what the future for future holds. Yeah, I recently I I, I would be talking about it, but of course, of course. <laughs> I'm no, sorry, I, I'm sorry. No, no it's, <laughs> it's totally fine. I was wondering if you just had anything else lined up after that or before that. Oh, no, no, uh, just finishing Little Mermaid and then and then um, doing that full time. So, well, if you want to find out what he's going to be doing, <laughs> please be sure to check him out. We're running out of out of our radio time, but. Where can they? Where can people find you? Uh, people can find me on my Instagram at bkrick three b k r i k k three, or my website at um, bradencricky dot com. And with all that said, we're gonna we're gonna end out our radio time, but we'll continue on Facebook Live uh, just to ask a few more extra questions that I I want to know. So if you want to check that out, please follow us on the story or facebook.com forward slash the story Corey Rosen. You can check out our Instagram. Uh, the under at oh my gosh I wish I could speak. <laughs> at the underscore story underscore podcast for all future <laughs> events and uh, guests coming up right now you, we're gonna play a song of mine that I wrote two years ago during COVID uh, what? yeah that's awesome and uh, it's called You Remain this is my uh, first first release song actually uh, I wrote this when everything started shutting down, and I realized that you know things here are temporary, and uh-huh. it's only truly that God remains. Yeah. With, with that said, that this is you remain by me. When I am weak, can no longer speak. You are there. 
right beside me When all hope is lost And I can't bear the cost You are there Paying it for me And when things turn to dust And there's nothing to trust You are there Honest to me Oh, it's clear who you remain by me with that said we're going to get you guys back to the radio and we're going to continue live on facebook.com so i'm curious out of all of these shows you've done mm-hmm. uh what is some some of the maybe uh bigger mistakes that maybe you have made or you've seen other people make and how can we prevent that for others <laughs> man you know they're they're with every show, there there come mistakes, you know, because we're all human. But I think part of the artistry and what, what makes it human is the fact that mistakes happen. But um, sometimes the most creative choices come from mistakes and whatever. Mm-hmm. But I did not – there was one recently that I, I had a not-so-creative or smart choice that I made um, when we were doing A Little Mermaid um, where, you know, when something happens unexpected during a show – um, usually it's smart to acknowledge it and move on, right? Because right. if you don't acknowledge it, then the audience, like if you drop something on the ground, you know, pick it up. Because if you if it stays on the ground, then the audience is going to be focused on that. They're not going to be able to pay attention to the story, right? Mm-hmm. Well, there was there was a moment um, during the first scene of Little Mermaid where there's there's one part where I'm throwing treasures back and forth, um, 
and and one of them dropped unexpectedly and um and it fell and and I tried to acknowledge it and the way that I acknowledged it was just very not in character oh. <laughs> basically I was like oh looks like it fell my bad um so my bad. <laughs> yeah my bad if if you don't know little mermaid um <laughs> which I don't know um but my my bad is not necessarily period um not quite. Not quite. <laughs> so that was I was getting a little bit of of flack for that um from castmates and stuff but um, but yeah, no, I mean, but things like that happen, you know, like, yeah, cause we're all human and, and, and stuff. And I, I, I've learned from that mistake, you know, like acknowledge it, but you know, acknowledging character. properly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but ad-lib so correctly, <laughs> <laughs> ad lib correctly. No, it's hard, you know, cause, cause you don't know exactly what's going to happen sometimes. Right. And, and you, you know, you want to live in that moment and, and, and acknowledge something, but, um, but sometimes, you know, you're like, well, how can we move on? Cause you don't know what's, you know. Did you ever What's see what you? happened? What happened that one time in Ruth uh, with the boat? Yes, when the <laughs> when the curtain got caught on that. Yeah, I was the person holding back the boat. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I noted. I noticed that the string was going, and I was like, "Oh no!" So I, oh, I was. I was, no. I was the person battling with the boat, <laughs> trying to trying to stop it from moving. No way. Yeah. Oh man, that's funny. It was. Yeah. It's funny. It was well, funny, but it well, was it was it was scary funny. at the time. Yeah, yeah right. Now right. it's funny. <laughs> Um, but yeah, actually we have a boat similar to that in Little Mermaid too, where we, we push it with our legs though, but <laughs> Flintstone's boat. <laughs> yeah, basically, basically. And then I'm like, I'm rowing as I do that. Mm. But, um, but yeah, oh man, other, mis- I don't know. Have there been other mistakes? Um, well, I, guess I mean, there have been other mistakes. I'm trying to, just trying to think of them. Maybe as like a student or. Um, oh, as a student. Um, you mean like when I'm performing, right? Uh, well, me, something like pre- preparation or preparation. or stuff like that. Stuff that you don't really think about, but it you know you should take advantage of. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, well, during one of our, I guess, forum performances, there was a. I think I, I had learned it takes two from hairspray, and um, and. But halfway through, I realized, like, I did, I just, I guess I didn't really do, like, my prep work as much as I could have because I, I kind of got lost halfway through and, and I, I, um, I had to start over and whatever. And so I guess the biggest thing is just to always make sure that you're prepared going into something, um, and, and as much as you can be. But the hard thing about acting is that sometimes you can be over prepared. Really? Um, yeah, because, at least for me personally and my personality type, um, if I over prepare, then sometimes my acting can seem robotic because I try to make every single thing specific and right. It's not organic, but anymore. it's not necessarily organic anymore. So, you know, sometimes my sometimes the best like acting choices that I've made have come from a song that I might that might be new to me, that I know well enough, but that I have something in my mind that I'm living off of and then I just kind of organically go from there. But if I have, if I had too many elements to it, if I think of too much of a backstory or if I think of it's, there's too many things, then it kind of, it kind of gets me in my head, mm-hmm. which, which makes it seem a little robotic. Um, but that being said, Oh, I'd rather be over prepared than unprepared. unprepared. You know right. what I mean? Um, you can always tone stuff down. Yeah, you can't. It's hard to turn stuff up in a moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, you need to make sure that you know you're putting in your work, and and every actor's process is going to be different because the way that someone works compared to someone else is it's it's just a personality game. Like like the the way that you think as an actor is going to be completely different. And so um, I think it's just important to just kind of figure out what your strategy is going to be preparing for a role. And what works for you, and try new things, like we were talking about earlier. Um, but even within your craft, you know, you can still try new things and and still take risks and 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 stuff like that. But um, but just trust yourself and and you know, learn as you go, hmm. and always be learning. So, yeah. So speaking of learning, what is one thing that you know now that you wish you had known when you first started? Um. Oh, that's a good question. What's one thing I know now that I wish I had known when I started? Um, 
that that acting is very subjective. Mm. It's very and I I knew that. I knew that growing up and I knew I knew that no matter what, you know, things people are going to always have opinions about, you know, your performance, what you bring to the table, but a show in general. I mean, but it's 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 the thing is it's very it's completely subjective. And so the way that one person views a show is going to be completely different than than someone else. Um but so I think you just got to you just got to keep in mind that you, you just got to you got to have confidence in yourself and what you're bringing to the table. Um and you and I think it's an, an, another important aspect and thing to have in this industry and I'm finding is very valuable is to have a support group of people that you know are always going to be there no matter if you're having a a winning streak right now or, or kind of like a losing streak like um it's important to have those people um and and not necessarily always be talking about theater but just kind of talk about you know life and stuff because you need you need those moments where it's not and not all need career break, right? you know and and that's one thing too that I've learned over the last year is is another thing is that you know for the last year I've been focused so much on the next thing and trying to audition for the next thing and make sure I have something lined up and and you know reaching out to people and 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 theaters and stuff um but you still got to enjoy the moment because you know the whole purpose of us doing this this career is is because we're passionate and we enjoy it you know it's and and it's easy to forget that once you're in the game and you're going hard and and you're trying to find the next thing it's it's easy to forget the reason why you do it which is because it's fun and, yeah. and because you you have you know you enjoy doing it and you're passionate about it and stuff like that so yeah so speaking of other things that you're passionate about uh you're a christian yes how does how does how has your faith maybe been challenged or grown over the past few years in regards to your career? Yeah, well, it's and it's similar to what I was saying earlier in, in terms of, you know, when, when I was at LBC, you're kind of in like a bubble. Mm-hmm. You're kind of in a specific culture of people and, and everyone has similar beliefs and, and they kind of, you know, they kind of line up in, in many ways. But when you go into this career and you, and you go and meet people and, and stuff like that, First off, well, it's 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 not necessarily a culture shock, but you get to you meet a lot of different people along the way, and so um, and the smart people at that too, mm-hmm. and um, and so when you meet those people, you know it, it's 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 really cool in a way because you kind of get to learn different perspectives of how people view the world, which I respect, and I think it's cool to hear someone's point of view because I think that you have something you might have something to learn from anyone that you talk to. Um, but that is one way that it's been challenged is because you're immersed in a different culture, you know, and and different cultures. Like Mm -hmm. every time you go to a different show, it's going to be different people involved and they might have different beliefs than you and, and that's okay. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's one way that, that I guess it's been, it's been challenged is, is just kind of adjusting to the new lifestyle of being an actor and surviving. (laughs) So, <laughs> so uh, what is worship to you? What do you consider worship? Worship. Worship is... She's about to give the textbook answer that we, the all, textbook we, all, answer. we all got well, through. I think worship is like... It can be anything. Anything can be done out of worship. Mm-hmm. Because I think that you're constantly either... I think that, you know, theater can be worship. And yeah. And singing, acting, dancing can be worship. It just depends on you know what you're doing it for. And so, um, I think that anything creative or even just like lifestyle, whatever, that can all be done out of worship. So I think worship is just any behavior that you do to that in, in honor of God or you know whatever it is you're worshiping. Right. But yeah. What are three shows that everyone should have under their belt? Three shows that everyone should have under their belt. Like e- even oh, like if you want to be a performer, if you want to be a performer, or if you're if you want to get into theater. Oh man, three shows that you should everyone should have under their belt. I don't know because there's so many. <laughs> I, there's so many. There's so many, and also trends are changing. Yeah, you know, all the time. But I think I think 
maybe if you have like one classical and one contemporary and one comedic. So let's think of one of each of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so maybe uh, like Phantom of the Opera. Well, I've never right. done Phantom of the Opera. I've well, I've never, I've never seen it actually. Oh, do you mean see? Do you mean like watch? should see? You should watch. Yeah. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, be in. Um. Okay. Um. Um. <laughs> this is such a hard. It okay. Is, such a okay. Hard question. Well, yeah. my, f- I guess I'll just say my favorite musicals, okay. <laughs> because they kind of shaped the way I view theater. Um, my favorite musical is ne- one of my favorite musicals is Next to Normal. Okay. Um, which I love because it adds a sense of realism to theater. And I know you're singing and, and stuff, but it, it the acting that I saw on the bootleg that I watched um, <laughs> was was just amazing. Um, and, and it's just a completely different type of story that just kind of helped pave the way for more like, like a Dear Evan Hansen type show mm-hmm. um, where there's like real issues in the world that are being talked about in a musical, you know? Um, and so that was really cool. And that's one show that I think a lot of people should see. Um, and then, um, I don't know. I don't know. I'll give one uh, for me. Okay, give uh, one for you. Aida. I believe oh, everyone should yes. see Aida. That's uh, good. That's partly because I'm a fanboy of Elton John. <laughs> and, well, because the music in there is just so good. And uh-huh. the story is also amazing as well. Yeah. Uh, so I... Th- and the, just the costumes that they got, I saw it done in Pittsburgh, and I still I is one of my favorite shows, I, and I've seen a few on Broadway as well. But mm-hmm. as, as, that's my favorite show that I've ever seen in person. Really? Because yeah, the way they the way have you ever seen Aida? I haven't actually. Oh, it's so good. It's and um, it's definitely worth seeing. It's one of my favorite shows of all time. Uh-huh. Uh And granted, I haven't seen many shows, but yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, that's that's a good one. Another favorite of mine, I'd have to say, is Hairspray. Oh um, yeah, it's a classic. Yeah, yeah it's a classic. Um, yeah, no, I I love Hairspray. Another one I haven't seen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, that one is just a little bit more comedic, and and it's it's a different style because a lot of the story in that one is is shown through like being on TV, right? Because they're always looking at the camera, and that that style from that time period was um, was just very more like proper and everyone said what they meant and there wasn't necessarily as much sarcasm in the culture and stuff like that. So it was just a different time. I love that one. And then, oh, what's the third one? What's the third one? Um, Could it be Footloose or Grease? Or uh, those are good. Those are good. Um, they're classics. Grease, yeah. Grease is, a good, is a good one. The movie, I love the movie version. The movie is amazing. But Grease and... Um, what about Hamilton? Theater too. Did you see Hamilton? Well, Hamilton is a new classic. Right. And and I mean, I would say Hamilton is one that you should see, but I feel like most people probably well at least know about it. Right. Um, but yeah, Hamilton is well, and I think that like I was saying earlier, that's that's definitely paved a way for new trends and, and like rap yeah. and theater and and um different elements of like casting too, because you know, um it it shows that like you know, in history, um, the people might have looked differently than, than they did in the casting of Hairspray, or mm-hmm. in Hairspray, in Hadestown, him, you right. know? And so it shows that that kind of stuff doesn't really matter. It's just it's just more about, like, what story, you bring to a right. character and how the story is being told, yeah. And so um, I think that's really cool. But, yeah, so so definitely, um, definitely, um, <laughs> what? <laughs> um... <laughs> Um, Hamilton. I can't Hamilton, think of right. the name for a second. Yes, yes. Sorry, a little delirious after. No, no, no. It's all, it's last all week. good. <laughs> so, last few questions. Yes. What is one thing? What is one role that you want to play, or have you already played it? Yeah. Well, and this kind of goes along with my favorite musical, but my my role that I want to play is Gabe in Next to Normal. Gabe um, in Next to Normal. Yeah, he's kind of the. I don't want to give too much of the story away, but. Um, he's kind of like a ghost of someone's consciousness. Um, huh. Yeah. The force ghost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, the nice thing about that role is, is I mean, it's not super, like, 
it's not super open-ended, but it is open-ended enough to the point that you can kind of create your own version of it. There, there's like a little bit more, like because because he is a ghost of like you and the person who the consciousness that you are portraying from should discuss what you think the character should be because it's kind of like a team effort, which I think is cool too. Mm. So, um, yeah, so that's a dream role of mine, and then um. And then also Link Larkin and Hairspray is probably a dream role of mine too. Okay. Um, that'd be kind of cool to play. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, I don't know why I literally am just saying the two musicals that I literally just said before. But um, well, that's all good. I know some people who are, uh, they're like actors and actresses and they don't know anything about, they know little about theater than <laughs> what you would expect. Like, well, it's it's just like it's just really hard. It's, it's just, hard, yeah. It's hard to to choose a few, you know, because I do know so many, a lot of right. musicals, but I guess I just have never narrowed it down to three before, you know. Uh, well, yeah. Thank you for asking this question because I know I'm gonna go home. I'm gonna think, think about, about it. it, and then I'm gonna message you later and be like, "This is what I should have said." This is what <laughs> I'm I should kidding. Said. No, it's, but uh, and there's and there's always new stuff coming out as well. Exactly. I, and it's never ending. I, I can't name three, like it's I can't name three <laughs> songs that I like. You know, what are your top <laughs> top three favorite songs? You can't ask somebody that. It's 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 just one of those things where it's like when you're asked in the moment, it's like and you forget oh, everything. There's so many. You know, it'd be different oh, if yeah. I knew just three musicals. But, right, of course. Yeah. Um. But um. I was gonna say, but yeah, I do tend to lean more towards the contemporary side. But I love song cycles too. Yeah. Um. And I love acting them too. Do you know Drew Gasparini at all? No. I so he's said. he's a musical theater composer. He's actually currently working on the Karate Kid musical they're developing. Oh really? Um, but he's my favorite musical theater po- composer, and he's written some song cycles. Um. And they're just all what's, story. What's a song? Cycle? Excuse me. Song cycles are basically a collection of songs that are like tied together by some sort of a like a, a theme or or um, like in this case, like it kind of tells a story in certain ways, but it's all connected in this like slightest way. So it's kind of like an album, just live. Yeah, it's it's like an album, but it's there's storytelling, storytelling. elements yeah. to it in this in this type of song cycle, um, like theater song cycles. Um, and so for Drew Gasparini, like each song tells its own story. Um, another example of a song cycle would be Theory of Relativity, which I know they did here. Yeah. Um, and that that is a song cycle. It, because like, you know everything is connected in a certain way, but you know, um, but it's it is like storytelling in the sense that that each song tells its own s- story on it uh, by itself too. Oh, so, so everything is a complete like is it kind of like uh, almost main? Um, almost main is like a show, like a show, right? Yeah, yeah but yeah, like yeah. that just in song form. Yeah, so because the song cycle is just songs, you know, and and you can put it into a story like and and it's it's you can kind of create your own story from a song cycle and it's very loose mm. um but um for the most part a song cycle is more of an album you listen to you know gotcha. yeah cool. so so you can perform it um but for the most part it's like an album and 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 a lot of the s- songs are like performed in like a cabaret style if that makes sense okay so they are storytelling, but it's more of like a cabaret, like where you're like you're just singing to people in a in a small, maybe small room, maybe big room. But that's cool. Yeah, because a lot of a lot of do you have you heard of Fifty Four Below? No, it's <laughs> I, was, I wish I it's could. okay. No, it's it's good. It's good. Um, Fifty Four Below is probably the most popular cabaret venue in New York. Oh, okay. um, but a lot of videos that I've seen of song cycles and things like that have been at Fifty Four Below on YouTube. So, um, yeah. So, with all that said, this has been Braden Cricky. <laughs> uh, people can find him at his Instagram. Mm-hmm. At, go ahead and say uh, bkrick3, B-K-R-I-K-K-3. <laughs> Check out his website, BradenCricky.com. Yep. Uh, all of his good stuff there. And uh, especially some big announcements coming out <laughs> so, some, sometime soon. Yeah, sometime soon. So with all that said, if you want to follow us, please be sure to check out, just search The Story, Corey Rosen, that's C-O-R-Y, no E, R-O-S-E. Dude, you, wouldn't, you would not 
imagine how many awards I have that misspell my name. <laughs> really? Awards? Awards from school, I'm by the sorry. way. I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry, bro. It's totally, I'm used to it at this point. <laughs> but but it's so funny to me. It's like literally they could have looked. Yeah. They could they <laughs> literally. Oh, man. But, oh, man. But yes, yeah, that's C-O-R-Y-R-O-S-E-N. You can find us on all streaming platforms. And if you want to check out upcoming guests and dates and events, please be sure to go over to facebook.com forward slash the story Corey Rosen or our Instagram at the underscore story underscore podcast. Next, this coming Wednesday, our interview with Bradley Hawkins of Dadly Productions is coming out. So please, please be sure to tune in then. That's Otherwise, awesome. we will be having Chris Keeney on. Do you know Chris Keeney at all? He was the guitar instructor here for for a I've while. Met him before. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna have him on Thursday at twelve, and then Kristen Brewer is gonna amazing. Be, is is gonna be coming That's on awesome. on Friday, and she and she is the one uh, one of the composers or the composer. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if there's yeah, multiple. I don't know. I don't know if there's multiple. But she's she's a she's the writer for uh she's one of the writers for Sight and Sounds music, and she has her own amazing scene collective. That you guys have you ever seen it? I don't think so. Oh, it's a gr- amazing scene collective. This the scene collective. It, it's so she took oh, all of the scene collective. The scene collective. Oh yes, right? I do. No, I have seen photos of it. Yeah. 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 Of, she takes these uh, stories from the Bible of all women and c- can uh, make songs out of them. Yeah, I've and heard a lot about it. I've heard a lot about incredible. it. Incredible. Yeah. So please check out that. With all that said, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day, and we'll see you guys later. Bye. <laughs>